Yeah, so my name's Jason Shepherd. Um, I've come down from Brisbane. Uh, I work for Red Hat in Brisbane. I do um, JBoss middleware, JBoss support. Um, I've also got uh, H. I can't pronounce his name. <laughs> How do you pronounce your name? Sorry. H. He also works for Red Hat. He's based here in um, Canberra. So um, he's a local consultant here. If anyone wants to speak to him later about any of our enterprise stuff, but. I'm, uh, I'm actually here talking about the community uh, version of uh, JBoss AS7. Um, so has anyone used AS7? One person. <laughs> OK. Uh, all right, the back, good. And um, yeah, cool. As, uh, do we have many Java EE programmers in the room? Yeah, got a few of those. A few people tinkering with Java <laughs> a little bit. OK, cool. Um, so. Yeah, AS7 is um, a Java EE application server, WebLogic, WebSphere, uh, JBoss. That's where we position ourselves. And um, yeah, so let's begin. So my, on my talk, I'm going to talk about the, um, the key features of AS7. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that are new in Java EE6, even though it's not that new. But um, so, so some things such as EJB 3.1. Manage beans, um, context and dependency injection, CDI. And then I'm going to have a look at some kind of ancillary features of JBoss, such as um, uh, integration testing with Aquilion and um, OpenShift Express. So, um, AS7, as I said, is the community edition. And um, the current release is 7.02. Um, soon we're going to release AS7.1. And EAP6, the Enterprise Edition, is going to be based on 7.1. Um, so that's due for release early 2012, so only three months or so. Um, yeah. So uh, the key features. So um, probably the best feature is it's lightning fast. Um, can start up in less than three seconds. Um, don't quote me on that, though, because it started in 17 seconds on my machine. but Slightly slower, but um, yeah, it has a simplified class loading structure. Has anyone here used JBoss 5? Yeah? And if I had any pain with class loading in JBoss 5? Yeah, it's, it's a real pain in the butt. So um, that's been cleaned up a lot with AS7. Um, so we now have a user focused um, uh, configuration. So a single configuration file for all your changes, JMS, queues, whatever. Uh, it's a lot easier to, to work with. and um, you can manage multiple instances at once with domain mode. Uh, kind of cool for systems administrators with, with a cluster of JBoss servers. Won't go into that too much today. And uh, a really small memory footprint, which positions us really good for cloud um, applications. So um, I'm going to do a little demo here. Um, break it up a bit. So uh, I've got. J console running, if you can see that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I can see my terminal. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch JBoss. <coughs> and let's see how long it takes to start up. I don't think I've got any apps deployed. 10 seconds. All right, um, so let's, um, let's hook up JConsole. Is my JBoss process. So my heat memory used is 30 gigabytes. Um, megabytes, sorry. So um, yeah, JBoss 5, uh, the minimum I got it running on was uh, 512, I believe. So this is with no apps running, and it's using 30, 30 megs of um, gig space. Has any of uh, 30 megabytes? Sorry, has anyone um, uh, used EC2 before? Amazon EC2. 
Yeah, I got, got one. So they kind of they sell um, server space in 32-bit uh, and 64-bit, and you know uh, if you can keep your app to a 32-bit machine, which is limited by the address space, like 30, 30 megabytes for the application server itself, you're leaving a lot of a lot of RAM for your application. So this is kind of the key benefits here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, I'm going to show you a nifty little feature. Um, I'm going to use the command line interface to deploy an application. So um, and I have to connect. And then uh, the cool thing about this is it has tab completion. So I don't know what commands are with the command line interface, so I'm just going to hit. Uh, it gives me a bunch of help. You can't really read that because it's not really put on the screen. But tab completion, here's all your commands. So what do I want to do? I want to deploy. OK, so let's try deploy. Deploy what? So I'm in my current directory, so I'm going to deploy. I'm going to deploy my app, which I prepared earlier. Greeter. I can't see that. I've gone off the screen, but hopefully that works. Oh, I put the wrong. I can't see my bloody screen. How's it going? Let's fix this. Okay. So I'm going to just point it to my file on my local file system. Boom. I've deployed it. So you can see JBoss has gone ahead. That's where it started. And it's going to um, start up the the um, CDI service because it detected that I had a it's a CDI app, and then it deployed my um, EJB. And let's have a look at what's happened to my memory. You can see the number of threads has gone up by about ten it's loaded new, ten new threads. So as I've, as I've deployed my application, it's had a look what I've got in my application and started the services that it needed for that. So that's how, how it manages to keep its um, footprint so low. Okay. Back to my presentation. So does anyone have any questions about that? No? Okay. I'm going to charge on. So um, in this case, I've got a, a beans.xml in my application. That's how it knew how to start the CDI service. Um, and uh, one of the things I do all the time with my customers with JBoss 5 is remove unused features. So there's no need to do that anymore because you're only loading the features you need. Um, yeah, so on the class loading, um, previously in, with JBoss 5, the class loading was all in one big heap. So if you deployed, say, something that uses Erxes or um, you know anything that the container itself uses, you end up with um, class loading problems because it can't figure out where it's putting to load, load the class from, from its jar or from your jar. So um, what's, what's happened with um, JBoss now is they've moved to uh, um, JBoss modules. So it, in, my, um, in my application, com.redhat.greeter, um, I've got a dependency on, on Weld, CDI. So, um, but Weld also has a dependency on SLF or J. But, uh, if I wanted to package SLF4J in my application, I wouldn't want to expose SLF4J. So JBoss draws a line straight down the middle and says, any, oh, I don't know how to do it. Here it is. Anything from here you can see. These ones you can't see unless I tell you you can see them. So that's how, basically how it works. And that means that I don't have any, I can't see any of the um, packages deployed in JBoss itself now. Yeah. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into Java EE. I know we don't have many Java EE progr programmers in the room, but do we have any Spring programmers? Yeah, up the back. Okay, got a couple. So this reminds me of what I what I learned about when I learned about Spring. That uh, it's a standard platform comprised of services. You know, higher signal to noise ratio, less code, power, powerful mechanisms for free. 
I just put my at transactional and I get transactional services. That's kind of what Java EE is as well. Um, and standardized so you can move between platforms. Um, so what was wrong with Java EE 5? Well, if anyone used EJBs, they had to use local and remote interfaces. Uh, they couldn't unit test their EJBs, um, integration test, sorry, their EJBs, because they had to load their whole container, which would take half an hour. But um, it, hey, had complex packaging ears, ear files were too complicated for both XML configuration and boilerplate Gini lookups. So e EJB 3.1 to the rescue. Phew. No more local and remote interfaces. Um, embeddable EJB 3 container. I'll show you an example later of um, bootstrapping the, EJ, uh, the EJB container, bootstrapping JBoss. You saw before it took 10 seconds, so I don't have to wait for my integration test anymore. Um, EJBs in WAR files, no more ears. And annotation-based configuration. And you can also use EJBs in the lightweight web profile. Some other features of Java EE6, um, the managed beam, um, specification, which we were talking about last night, but um, Google and Spring Source submitted this um, this specification, and um, it's become Java EE6. Uh, I'll go into it a bit in more detail later. Um, context and dependency injection, which is actually based on Seam2, which is a, a Red Hat um, framework. So that's a core part of the specification now. We're pretty excited about that, and. Um, EJB 3.1, which I visited already. So yeah, what, does, what are managed beans? So everyone saying, I've got a bean. There's a JSF managed bean. There's a um, EJB bean and all these other people, you know, Spring, Google Juice, CDI. So we need a unified definition of what is a bean. So this is where the managed bean specification comes in, and it specifies what a bean is. So uh, a bean is um, something that has lifecycle callbacks, resource injections, and interceptors, and it's a foundation spec for any injection framework, including CDI and Spring. So, um, yeah, resource injections being completely revisited between EE5 and EE6, and um, we now, oh, we used to have a closed sort of um, injectable resources, here they are, at AGB, uh, persistence context, persistent unit, blah, blah, blah. Not very many of them and not, often not that useful. Um, not compared to things like Spring anyway. We can inject anything you want. So, um, but we've gone a step further and we've said that um, from what Spring does, and uh, I think, oh, let's keep going here. Um, Name-based injection is, is um, fragile. So uh, your IDE can't uh, automatically refactor your um, injection name based on a change. But um, with, uh, I didn't put that in, but um, yeah, CDI uses type-based injection. So you can, the ID, you can pick up changes more easily. Okay, so what is CDI? Um, CDI is the marriage between the, the web tier, JSF, and your transactional layer, um, to put it simply. So um, it provides service, uh, services for Java EE components, like um, lifecycle life cycle management for um, stateful beans bound to context, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, automatic transaction management for your web apps. So um, basically what this means for web apps is uh, flushing your uh, Hibernate um, session. Um, you, could, you don't really need to do that manual anymore. CDI does it for you, <clears throat> and um, a type-safe approach to dependency injection. Um, I'm going to put my slides, we'll provide a link to my slides to anyone who wants them, and they can look through the uh, world reference documentation to find out more about it, about CDI. Okay, so I'm going to jump into this simple example. Um, I'm just using one, one um, uh, managed bean here, which is my greeter. Uh, so this is just this class manage greeter uses my greeter EJB, which I'm injecting into it. It doesn't do anything. It just assigns uses greeter to get the message. So and this is the actual EJB. 
Um, it just decorates the name. And yeah, this is how I use my, my manage greeter in my, um, in my app. So I'm going to jump out of here again. I'm going to time, 40 minutes. So, um, IDE. So I'm using Eclipse and I've got JBoss tools installed. Yes, okay. So, um, okay. I don't know what happened there. I don't know why it's not picking up my string class, but anyway, this is my um, this is my greeter, um, just like I had in my slides, and my manage greeter. I haven't set up my dependencies correctly in my in my IDE, so that's all red. But anyway. Um, you can see it's the same as what I had in my um, in my slides. So I'm just going to take out my scope there, and I'm going to um, test my application by deploying it to my container from my IDE. So um, Anyway, I've got it here, so I'm going to start it, and hopefully it's still deployed. Hmm. <laughs> Not the greatest example in the world. I've got some build problems. Okay, I'm going to skip this example. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have time to fix it now, but um, you just have to believe me that that works. Um, I'll go back to my my presentation for now. Um, yeah, so um, from Java E5 to Java E6, um, JSF managed beans become CDI, and uh, no more JSBs. We're using facelets now. Um, yeah, so I talked a little bit earlier about scopes and um, where does, how long does the greeter live for? Um, well, you can define different scopes. So in this case, I've defined a request scope. So that means that the greeter is going to live for the time of the request. Um, there's also other scopes such as um, application scope and session scoped. Application scope being like your traditional um, spring bean, which is available the, for the whole life of the application. Um, and session scope being for the life of the user session. Um, Pretty handy way to manage user variables when you don't have to manually um, play with the session yourself and risk wasting uh, resources by losing objects in the session. Um, and there's also a special scope called the conversation scope, which I'll um, I'll cover a bit more detail. Um, and you can define your own scopes as well. So um, yeah, just the request scope is smaller than the conversation scope. And the conversation scope can be equal to the session or less than that. So um, a conversation context, um, the boundaries are demarcated by the application itself. And I'll show you an example of that. Uh, and so this is how um, Seam or CDI can, can manage your Hibernate session for you. Because at the end of the conversation, Seam automatically flushes your uh, Hibernate um, session and all your objects are persisted to the database. 
So um, no fear of exceptions on lazy, lazy fetch operations. If anyone's uses uh, open session in view, they might have run into problems where uh, they try to access a, a list after the page has been rendered, but they can't because um, they get a lazy fetch operation. Um, so, um, yeah, this is a conversa conversation scoped uh, bean, booking agent, uh, for a hotel booking, typical example. Um, and when I find my uh, hotel, uh, when I find my uh, hotel, I'm going to begin my conversation, uh, probably display my, my hotel, and then, um, I haven't got this running, but, um, <clears throat> after, after the booking's been confirmed, maybe a few pages later, I just end my conversation, and all of the, all of the Hibernate, uh, session gets flushed to the database, and everything's persisted. Okay. So, um, I'm going to have a quick look now. I'm going to move on to Aquilian, um, unless anyone's got some questions on my uh, CDI scope section. No. Um, okay. So, Aquilian. Uh, so, integration testing with EJBs. Um, in the past, that would have seemed practically impossible. Um, some, some people do it. They use Ant to start up their container and then run their, uh, run their apps or deploy their apps and test them somehow, maybe using Selenium, I don't know. But it's always been a pain in the backside because, um, you had to deploy your whole app, you had to package it, you had to start up your container, which took forever. So with Aquilian, what we've got is, um, a simple way to package just the classes that you want to test and deploy them to your container and test in the actual container that you're going to be running on in production. So um, here's an example of packaging um, some classes that you want to test. Uh, also packaging a properties file, which is needed for, the, for this test. Um, so it's just using some shrink wrap classes here. And um, Aquilian has some, some separate options. You can choose to run it embedded mode, which runs in the JVM of JUnit, or um, remotely. So you can deploy this app, this archive to a remote JBoss or other container and run your test remotely. Um, yeah, and it supports injection into test classes and tests can be run from an IDE or build script. Now, I think I'll be able to run this using Maven. I think my, my project, my IDE uh, project is a bit broken at the moment. Don't know why, but um, I don't really have time to fix it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you my uh, test class. Yeah, so um, all I'm doing is I'm saying that I want to run this with Aquilian. Uh, that's a JUnit um, J uh, annotation. And then um, I'm specifying what I want to deploy. So in this case, I'm just packaging this um, this class into uh, a jar file called test.jar. And um, yeah, so you can see here in my test, I've actually injected my EJB. Um, impossible in Java, well, uh, without using Aquilian. And um, yeah, I'm, I've got a simple test here, which tests the decorated string that I passed in. So this was working in my ID before, but it's not going to work now. So, um, not sure why, but I'm going to run it in Maven. Oh yeah, that's the other thing I should show you. It's not that simple. I just needed to add some, So I've got a dependency here on Aquilian, just a standard project dependency. And then, um, and then at the bottom, I'm, uh, I've got a profile, which this is a managed profile. So um, it's going to boot, bootstrap JBoss in the, in the JVM, in this JVM, not 
deploy it remotely. Uh, okay, so now if I should be able to use Maven to run this. All I have to do is just pass my profile to it, which I can't remember now. This one. And hopefully, that'll bootstrap JBoss and run my test <clears throat> in it. Oh, my test failed. Expected hello, Aquilian, but was goodbye, Aquilian. Okay. I can fix that. I think my, my greeter returns goodbye. Hmm, okay. I can fix that. Let's try again. <clears throat> I might have set that up to fail. <laughs> hey, so that's success that time. Let's just go back and have a look what it did. It's funny that I can't see it. I thought I could see it starting up my container there, but it hasn't printed that in its log. I don't know why. But anyway, you can tell it's actually testing my classes, and it's using an EJB, so it must be bootstrapping a container, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to test my EJB. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I've unit tested integration testing with EJBs. Um, so just to, I've still got a fair bit of time left, which is good. I might be able to fix my project. But um, I'll go back to um, my slides for now. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, just covering what I already covered about the POM. So I've just got... The dependency on um, Aquilian in my in my POM. Um, do people use Maven in here? Maven users, yeah, cool. Um, so I think um, there even may be a um, a, a pre-built uh, I forget what you call it uh, artifact for Maven builds that you can start from. Uh, if not, the the JBoss. Um, Deployable has some um, test applications in it. One of them's called Kitchen Sink, um, which I actually have open in my IDE. So I might be able to show you that one running, which would be a nice little, which will repair my um, previous. Yes. So here it is. Here, this example comes from. Um, comes with JBoss as the um, test one. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and run this and play with it. Has anyone used JBoss tools before from Eclipse? No. Um, yeah, so this is basically Eclipse with JBoss tools plugin installed. So what it allows me to do is it allows me to basically have my, my server here and I can manage deploy to my server, redeploy my application and manage it all from my IDE here. Um, so 
as you can see, I've got my, my JBoss server installed already. I just pointed to my remote path of where I've got JBoss installed. And then um, I can just, if my application's building correctly, which is this one actually is, um, I can just run it on the server. And it's going to ask me which server. I want JBoss. You can see I've actually got another server installed here, which is um, VMware vFabric. I think I guess that's another that's another um, plugin that does allows that. So um, this one's actually going to work, I think. Hey. So you can see now I've actually yeah um, run that from within my IDE, deployed it. And yeah, this, this example actually comes with um, Acrylion built into it. So if I have a look at its POM, you can use this as a starting point for your, your projects, your, to start using Acrylion in your project. So this is what I did with my application. So um, yeah, I think it's actually got both of the profiles as well. I'll just go to the bottom. Yep, it's got two different profiles. So um, the, this is the one I'm using in my Greeter application, um, the managed one, so it's running the, um, running within the, uh, IDE, sorry, within the JVM of, of the, of Maven, or however you launch it, and then the remote one, which is, um, oh. yeah. Specifying that it's going to open a remote um, JBoss and deploy it there. So what I might actually do is try and run these unit tests to show you that it does actually work from the IDE. Um, so you can see I've got the same kind of same kind of thing here. Run with Aquilion. Um, I'm packaging it all up and. Uh, I mean, this time I'm, I'm injecting a, uh, a managed bean instead of an EJB, but same kind of thing. Uh, and then I'm running a simple test. So let's see if this works from the IDE. Yeah, there it is. Hopefully. Launching. Hmm. Doesn't want to work. <laughs> oh, there we go. Hey, well, that was okay. It it bootstrapped the it bootstrapped JBoss. I don't know why it's not printing that out to the logs, but uh, it's actually yeah it run that in the container. Um, unfortunately, it didn't show me all the logs. I don't know why, but um, yeah. So it actually um, injected those managed beans into the container, ran the test, and it's given me a green light. Um, I guess I could go and break the test somehow just to prove you to you that it's actually running in here. Um, Don't know how I could do that, because I'm not too familiar with this code, but yeah, I guess you just have to believe me that it actually works from the IDE as well. Um, so let's go back to my presentation. Um, Yeah, so this is just some more stuff on Aquilion. So, um, basically I've covered all that already. So, uh, yeah, if anyone wants to get a hold of my slides and, and have a play around with that stuff, then, um, this is all you need to do it. You need to grab JBoss, um, download Eclipse and JBoss tools and, um, 
yeah, view the quick start documentation. There's excellent documentation on AS7. Um, have a look at it. And uh, you can read more about Weld here and the CDI Java docs. Um, Aquilian also has excellent documentation. And there's the demos that are available from the first link there as well, including the kitchen sink one. Um, yeah. So, let's keep going. So now I'm going to talk about OpenShift. Has anyone heard of OpenShift before? Yeah, one, cool. Um, so OpenShift uh, comes in two flavors, uh, Express and Flex. And uh, Express is really cool uh, because it's not just Java. You can uh, also deploy Perl, PHP, Python, and Ruby, Ruby apps to OpenShift. Um, and it's basically, I'd sum it up as free shared hosting. So I think you get about 250 megabytes of disk space and um, yeah, there's a small allocation of space that you can use to host applications. Um, and Flex is a more powerful um, version of Express. Um, we describe it as a platform as a service, which maybe you've never heard of that term before. Um, but it's basically, yeah, a, um, a, a JBoss install with a few other features, such as auto scaling, performance monitoring, and application management from our web console. And um, yeah, for Flex, we have Java and PHP. Um, so uh, how do you get started with OpenShift Express? All you need is an email address. Um, you just register. Um, I'll show you that in a sec. Uh, install the RHC command line tools. So they're available for Mac, uh, Linux, Windows, whatever. Um, create a domain. Um, so if my domain was domain, then this is how my final URL would look to my app. This is the name of my app, my domain, at redhat.redhat.com. And um, create an application with this command. Um, I'll run through that briefly since I've got a bit of time. And uh, basically, after that, I was toying around with this this morning. <laughs> um, I got it, finally got it working. But um, basically, what I did with my Greeter application, which you saw uh, working with Maven a minute ago, is um, when you create the new app, it uh, creates a Git repository for you on, on the um, OpenShift server. And then it pulls down the Git repository. So if you're working in that directory, you've got all the um, Git configuration that you need there. So you just basically copy your application into that folder where it's given, downloaded the example application for you, add your files, commit them, I'll show you in a sec. Uh, and then you just use git push. And um, as long as you've got the OpenShift profile, um, our, uh, the OpenShift server just goes OK. Um, I know how to build this, builds it, and um, uh, deploys your application to the live server. Um, yeah, so you can have a live application from your console running git push, which is, um, I think it's pretty cool, pretty cool feature. So, um, that's kind of the end of my talk. So I'm going to do the OpenShift demo. Still got 15 minutes, which is heaps of time. So, um, Okay, so here I am at the OpenShift um, homepage, and if I just sign out, I hope my phone's still working. Yes, okay. So, um, if I want to register, all I need is my email address, password, prove I'm a person, and I'm in. So once I'm registered, uh, it doesn't cost anything, it's free. So um, I'm going to sign in. Uh, I'm 
running off my um, three mobile network. So it's a bit slow. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically it gives you all oh, powers coming soon. So I've, I've talked about Express and uh, Flex. So under the Express one here, there's really good documentation. Um, there's uh, some videos you can watch, which I didn't actually find that useful because I couldn't copy and paste from the video. <laughs> um, if you want to watch the videos, you can see how simple it is to get started. It's all just um, screen capture from someone's console. Um, but I prefer the quick start section because it prints it all out and I can copy and paste it into my console. But uh, basically it just says you need to install the client tools, the REC um, client tools, which I have installed here on my Mac. Got it for Linux, Mac. Uh, yeah, create a domain name, which I'll step through. Yeah, so it's all here. Um, actually, there's um, the community and there's actually pr prepared documentation about this as well. And if you run into any problems, um, jump onto Freenode and there's an OpenShift channel in there. And um, I jumped on there at hour, like 10, 10 a.m. and I spoke to someone in Washington who was up all night. And uh, yeah, he helped me out with the um, problem I was having with it. So yeah, they're really helpful there. Uh, ask, a, ask a question in the community forums. Um, so yes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my domain now. control panel and I can see I've already got an application deployed here which is the greeter application I uh, didn't run before but I showed you before um, so and this is the my domain is jzina so I'm gonna just demo it quickly I uploaded it this morning also there is my git repository URL so I can run my can pull it down onto my local machine so Okay, I don't like goodbye. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna change it. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, or should I show you creating an app first? Hmm. Maybe I'll do that. So you you have an option here of um, in your control panel of cre uh, creating an application here. Uh, you have to create a domain first, but um, it's pretty simple. So let's let's create a a app called test and I want it to be a JBoss application and add it. Um, it says in the documentation that you if you're going to do it from the command line you need to have a good internet connection because it needs to reconnect a couple of times but so I can do it from here or I can do it from the command line. Um, It's a bit slow. Um, I'm not even familiar with a lot of these things. WSGI, Rack PHP, but I'm sure many of you will be familiar with them and and uh, and be able to use them to create a project of your own. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> My, my internet connection is not very good at the moment. Maybe I'll just try again. I might show you the... Um, so this is the RHC client tools. Um, I'm going to try this one. If I just type it without any um, username, it should prompt me for a username. Yeah, so it says I don't really know what you're doing, so I need to pass an application to it. So I'm going to try and see if my test application is there. Um, I'm going to 
pass the status command. It doesn't like my permissions on my directory, but that's okay. So yeah, my test one didn't get created yet. <laughs> But you can see there I'm interacting with the cloud server from my command line, so that's pretty pretty neat. Um, well, let's try and create the app here again. Well, let's just check what happened. Still going. This is why you need to have a good internet connection to do it, <laughs> not a mobile phone. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to be possible. But it's okay. I've um, I prepared one earlier. Um, so this is my my URL. I can do things like um, I might uh, I might check it out here. So I'll do a git clone of my repository. I've only got a few minutes left. But, um, yeah, you can see I've checked out my, my repo here. And um, so what I might do is I actually, I checked it out earlier, and it's actually this application here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change the message slightly. So I'm going to change one of the beans, and I'm going to uh, commit it and push it, and you can see it live on the server. So, where is it? So my, um, actual greeter. Yeah, it says goodbye, but I don't like that. I'm going to say hello again. So, if I, this is actually back in the other directory. This one. So if I just do git status, um, I can see I've added a couple of files there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the one that I just changed, which is the... Uh, I probably could have set this up to do it in my IDE, but... <laughs> it's that one. So... Just add the others as well. All of those. So I think I've got everything ready. Let's add that one as well, just to make sure I'm all up to date. Oh shit, I'll stop it. I'll just do a git push now. So that should update my remote repository and build it. And that should be live on my domain. Good. Okay, so ha. Well, you can see it's changed. <laughs> I think what it's done now is I, I, I earlier I took off the. Um, in the managed greeter class, I took off the yeah, I made I took off the scope, which means that now my my name is not in scope when it comes back through, so it doesn't pick up that I've added one. So I guess if I change that and added it again, uh, I think that's in my history. Yes, let's do that. Try 
try again, and that should work. Um, yeah, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Hopefully that'll work. But um, does anybody have any questions about anything I've talked about today? No? Shame. Who's going to try OpenShift? Cool. Some people are going to try OpenShift. That's good. Who's going to try AS7? <laughs> yeah? Cool. All right. Good. Um, and I guess I should mention that uh, Red Hat has, you know, um, Enterprise Edition as well, so which will be released in um, January or February. And um, if you buy a subscription to JBoss from us, uh, you can talk directly with me and I'll help you on any support issues you have, development, production issues, whatever it is. Um, yeah, there's a whole team of us worldwide ready to help you. Um, and you can talk to H here and he'll hook you up with a, <laughs> with a subscription. Um, so yeah, let's have a look if my, uh, my change has worked. Hey, there we go. So I've got a live, a live website. You can access it from your machine. Give it a go. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, a question? Great. Yeah? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, so this is where my application is deployed currently. Um, before you create an application, you have to create a domain. Um, and that basically sets up um, SSH key. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's pretty simple. I mean, follow through the, the um, documentation there on how to create a domain. I had some troubles because um, if I go to a different machine, often my SSH key is different. But uh, what you just need to do is is get the SSH key the, uh, off your you know off your other machine or off your other developers and share them around, and then you can all use the same domain. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. For Here's something to help you through the late night coding. All right. Okay. Thank you. Cool.